Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm, um, as you know, I'm Thierry van Swiefeld. I'm teaching medical law at the University of Antwerp in Belgium. I'm an attorney at the law firm The Wallens and Partners, and I'm also uh, very glad to be a member of the Board of Governors of uh, the Wamo. Um, thank you for being here, and I also wanted to thank uh, Oren Asman. He's uh, doing an amazing job as a local organizer of this conference, and um, he took the ambitious initiative um, for a bioethics and law center here at the Tel Aviv University, and he is also uh, really a wonderful guy. Um, I got to know him better when he visited my hometown, Antwerp, a few months ago. Uh, together, together with the famous lawyer, Philippe Duvalens, we had an exquisite lunch in the best restaurant in Antwerp. And... Um, we had a great time. It was uh, also Oren who encouraged me to have a talk about uh, a unique case of mass murder in a hospital in uh, which has shocked Belgium. It's uh, the case of the deacon of death. Um, a deacon, as you may know, is a subordinate officer of uh, in some churches, like in this case, the Catholic Church. I have divided my presentation into three sections. Uh, first, I will give you the facts of the Deacon of Death case. Second, um, I will explore the boundaries of the obligation of medical confidentiality. And third, I will focus on end-of-life decisions. So let's start with the facts of the Deacon of Death case. Ivo Poppe was uh, a nurse uh, in, in hospital in 19, from 1980 until 2002. Um, in 2002, he was ordained to the deaconhood and he was also a pastoral assistant in the same hospital. As a pastoral assistant, he um, was visiting the sick, he gave assistance to the dying and he had contact with the next of kin. Um, in 2013, he was plagued by sleeping problems and nightmares. Initially, he consulted a psychologist, and afterwards he consulted a psychiatrist. Uh, that's important, but that's uh, for later. He, so he consulted a psychiatrist. And um, during these consultations, he confessed to have ended the life of uh, dozens of people. The psychiatrist notified the police, and Poppe, the deacon, was taken into custody. Poppe confessed to have ended the life of four family members in the hospital, and he estimated he had ended the life of around 20 people, around 20 people, it could have been more, but could not remember their names. He, Papa argued he had acted out of compassion with a sense of responsibility and because the patients were terminally ill and suffered severe pain. So when Papa was accused of several crimes and um, when someone is accused of a crime in Belgium, he is summoned to appear before the Assize Court. He is to be tried by a jury of 12 laymen. And to give you an, an impression of, uh, of, to give you a good idea of uh, this uh, trial in this Assize Court, I put this um, picture of, uh, of the trial in my PowerPoint presentation. So. Um, these are the three professional judges. Here are the jury of 12 laymen. This is a public prosecutor. It's also, um, uh, the hearing is open to the public. So the, the trial uh, was for two weeks and we have heard and questioned uh, more than 80 witnesses. Here you can see, if you see very closely, you see the accused, the deacon. Here you see two lawyers of the accused. And here you can see the lawyer of the hospital, the well-known lawyer, Raf van Goetem, who is, always, who is also attending this conference. So, um, that is an size court trial. The judgment was of end of January 2018, and Papa was found guilty of a fivefold murder. He, the murder of two granduncles, his father-in-law, and another patient. Uh, and also the murder of a parent, his mother, which is a specific, more serious crime in uh, Belgium. And the Assize Court argued that there was no euthanasia because there was no consent of the patient. 
there was no gentle death because he injected air um, in, in the patient and uh, this caused a death struggle of several minutes and he was acting out of a sense of power. So uh, the deacon was sentenced to 27 years of imprisonment. And this case attracted much attention from the press, from the national press and from the international press. And the case is now generally known as the deacon of death case. So the two legal topics were at the center of the discussion in this case. Uh, on the one side, medical confidentiality, and on the other side, murder and other end-of-life uh, decisions. I will first explore the boundaries of the obligation of medical confidentiality. Needless to say that trust between a physician and a patient is very important, is an important value. Uh, it encourages people to visit the patient, but also to uh, communicate very openly with their physician. Many countries have included the obligation of medical confidentiality in their penal code. Um, but it's an important value, medical confidentiality, but it's not an absolute value, it's not an absolute obligation. It can come into conflict with other interests, for instance, life and health of third parties. So, um, in several countries, it is accepted that a physician can breach his obligation of medical confidentiality in the public interest, for instance, when there is a case of uh, child abuse. Um, if we apply this to the uh, deacon of death case, we can emphasize an interesting issue. Because as I told you before, initially the deacon consulted a psychologist. And the psychologist um, thought there was no danger, there was no, there was no third party in danger. And so he didn't breach his obligation of medical confidentiality. But afterwards, the deacon consulted a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist thought, well, I think he's still a danger for a third party, and he breached his medical confidentiality and warned the police. So, in theory, it seems quite simple to accept um, the, the right of disclosure, Eh? when the life or the health of a third party is in danger. But in practice, it's not that self-evident to draw a line between an imminent danger and no danger at all. So human behavior is not always foreseeable, and physicians can differ, can have differing opinions. So the law should acknowledge the possible difference of opinion be between caregivers or physicians. So let's move on now to the second issue in the deacon of death case, the other medical decisions at the end of life. Um, as you may know, since 2002, Belgium has a law on euthanasia. Um, and euthanasia is defined as intentionally terminating the life by a, by a physician at the written request of the patient. So um, several uh, conditions have to be fulfilled, but there are two very important conditions. First, there has to be a serious and incurable disease of the patient. This is the so-called objective condition, because it's the, it's the physician who has to judge about this condition. And there is another condition, the condition of unbearable physical or mental suffering, and that is the so-called subjective condition, because it is the patient who will judge about this condition. And um, on average, every year, 2,000 people die due to euthanasia in Belgium. And most frequent reasons are oncological disorders like malignant tumors, uh, polypathology, and diseases of the nervous system. If we apply these conditions to the deacon of death case, uh, it's very clear there is no euthanasia in this case because there was no written request uh, there was also no oral request of the patients and there was also no physician involved. So Belgium has also adopted the law on palliative care. Palliative care is defined as health care to patients suffering from a life-threatening disease that is no longer responding curative therapy. Palliative care implies multidisciplinary approach in which attention is given to the physical, mental, social and moral needs of the patient. It implies also pain management. If we apply this to the deacon of death case, uh, the immediate action of the deacon to end the life of the patient was definitely no palliative care. Another medical decision at the end of life is pain relief and a possible life-shortening effect. 
The law on patient rights in Belgium states that each patient has the right to receive the most adapted care from health professionals to prevent pain, to treat pain and to ease pain. If we apply this to the deacon of death case, um, the intention of the deacon was to end the life of the patients immediately and there was no alleviation of pain with life shortening effect. So finally, there is uh, a last possible end of life decision, the withholding or withdrawing of life prolonging futile treatment. As the ethical code of medical conduct states in Belgium, a physician must avoid and may refuse treatments which have no sufficient medical indication. If we, we cannot apply this to the deacon of death case, it was not established that the treatment was useless or futile. So this brings me to the end of my lecture and to the take home message. In this case, I think the assize court could only conclude the deacon had ended the life without request of the patient and thus committed murder. It is a unique case for Belgium. It has shocked Belgium. It has shocked physicians and shocked a lot of lawyers as well. Uh, but surprisingly, I've done some research about this. Uh, nurses have also ended the life of patients without their request in other country. Very famous case is the um, Wetlauer case in Canada, where a nurse uh, ended the life of eight patients. And um, even more famous is the Hügel case in Germany, where a nurse ended the life of more than 30 patients. Um, Second point is, did this case question the law on euthanasia in Belgium? Well, since, we in, since 2002 we have the law on euthanasia, a patient can ask his physician in all openness to perform euthanasia when the legal conditions are fulfilled. The trial of the deacon of death did not question the law of euthanasia because the legal conditions of this law were not fulfilled. I think the message is whether you have a law on euthanasia or not, human behavior is unforeseeable and criminal behavior cannot always be prevented. And an individual can always abuse a law, also a law on euthanasia. It was a coincidence that the deacon consulted first a psychologist and afterwards a psychiatrist and that Papa, the deacon, confessed the murders to the psychiatrist and to the police. Due to the feelings of guilt of the deacon, this case ended in a trial and ended in a conviction and also in a presentation at the WAML conference in Tel Aviv. Thank you for being here.